two one two. All right. Seems to be okay. Yeah. Okay, good. Thanks. So I turned up the volume. <laughs> Yeah, sure. All Whenever is good. What? Shall we start? Yeah. Sounds good. All right. Good morning, everybody. So it's a very Thomas Dumitrescu morning. We'll have him at nine and then again after the coffee break. So that means you, you have to, it's great to ask a million questions, but you need to ask a question while he's walking to coffee so he can drink a cup in between his two lectures today. So let's turn it again to Thomas talking about generalized symmetries in QFT. Thank you. Sounds good. Good morning. Um, so uh, let me remind you where we left off yesterday. I talked a lot about free field theory. Uh, that's going to stop very soon, but not quite yet. Um, so I talked about free Maxwell theory in four dimensions and how to formulate it in its standard version. Yeah. Can I move the mic up? Yeah. How's this? Better? OK, great. Um, how to formulate it in its standard presentation, how to derive it as dual presentation, the fact that it has two continuous one-form symmetries associated with the fact that both star F and F are closed to forms because of either the Bianchi identity or the Maxwell equations, and which one is which depends on the presentation you're using. In other words, it depends on the duality frame. In the standard presentation, the magnetic one follows from the Bianchi identity. All right. And then we discussed Wilson and Etuft loops, which are charged under those symmetries. And we made contact with the standard definition of a Coulomb phase in terms of a Coulomb potential between static charges, and the fact that these one-form symmetries are spontaneously broken. So we talked about the symmetries. We talked about the charged objects. We talked about symmetry breaking. The next thing on my list from the very beginning about good things to do with symmetries is to couple them to suitable background fields. And this is very useful. It's a clean way, for example, of figuring out what to do with the currents, how to look at their correlation functions, think about contact terms, so forth. But it's also an excellent way to uh, learn about anomalies. So that's what I want to do next. What are the appropriate background fields for such two-form currents? Well, you know, 
if you think of the p-form symmetries as a sort of straightforward generalizations of an ordinary symmetry with extra anti-symmetric indices, then the ordinary background gauge field, which is a one form for a standard symmetry, would generalize to a higher form background gauge field. And that's indeed what happens. So the appropriate background fields for these symmetries are two forms, B electric and B magnetic. So there are two forms, but they're gauge fields. Unlike Greg, I will not be careful about distinguishing between well-defined and non-well-defined forms. So you have to stay with me. And these things transform under gauge transformations, which involve D of a one-form gauge parameter. Like everything moves up one form degree. The gauge field is a two-form. The gauge parameter itself is a one-form. And, and more importantly, the gauge parameter itself is also not a globally well-defined one form, right? Just like the gauge parameter for an ordinary U1 gauge transformation, for example, that of the actual dynamical Maxwell field involves a compact scalar lambda, which has an identification by 2 pi. And in particular, that means it can have non-trivial winding around one cycles. This gauge parameter lambda is itself a U1 gauge field at least locally. It's itself a U1 connection, and that means it can have fluxes. Okay, And it's quantized in exactly the same units as a standard U1 connection is. OK, let's try this one. So in other words, the fluxes of d lambda electric and d lambda magnetic over any two cycle are themselves in 2 pi z. So here I'm just describing the standard presentation of B, B fields, gauge fields. You might be very familiar from the, with them from string theory or from supergravity, where they are dynamical. And here they are background fields, but they obey the same kinds of rules. We just don't path integrate over them. All right. At least not yet. We'll path integrate over them soon. So we want to couple these background fields to Maxwell theory in such a way that they couple to these currents. And moreover, as you will remember for the case of ordinary symmetries, the fact that the currents are conserved means that we should do this in a way that preserves the background gauge transformations. That's tantamount to current conservation. And we'll try to do our best, and we'll see that we will almost make it, but we'll fail by a little bit. So what's the correct way to couple Maxwell theory to these fields? So here's the claim. I haven't written the Maxwell action yet, because I'm going to immediately write it in the presence of B electric and B magnetic. The first piece involves taking the action I had yesterday, which involved F and star F, and shifting them by B electric. This looks kind of like minimal coupling, and it is. You'll see that in a second. It's very similar to how we would couple an ordinary gauge field with the shift symmetry of a compact boson. I have to remember that the electric symmetry is the analog of the shift symmetry. And the magnetic symmetry doesn't couple like this. It has a, well, let's call it a more interesting coupling. It has a BF type coupling that involves integrating the background field BE against the dynamical field strength. I've put the 2 pi here for a reason that I'll explain. The I is necessary in Euclidean signature because this is a parity odd term. That's BF, right? Sorry, yes, very good. So at least one person is fully awake. <laughs> All right. So as you start waking up, please start asking questions. All right. So the first thing that you can see is that if you expand this to linear order in the Bs, then you'll get linear couplings of the Bs to those currents, with coefficients 1 or i, roughly speaking, so that the Bs are standard sources for those currents. In other words, if you take functional derivatives with respect to B electric or B magnetic, you insert currents, the corresponding currents, into the path integral. You can think of the, after you do the path integral over this, You'll get the generating functional for the currents in terms of the background field. 
Now, there's, you see there's also a quadratic term here involving BE squared, roughly speaking. That's like a Siegel term, and we'll see that's necessary for, uh, for maintaining this gauge invariance. OK, so I've told you how the background fields are supposed to transform under these symmetries. Now, clearly, we also need to transform the dynamical fields, otherwise this will not be a symmetry. So how do the dynamical field transform? The claim is that the dynamic field A, which is a U1 connection, shifts by the electric background lambda, which is also a one U1 connection. And it makes sense to add U1 connections because they have the same periodicities. That's why the coefficient here is 1. And you see that this combination F minus B has been engineered in such a way that dA minus d lambda is gauge invariant. So this combination is gauge invariant. That's why I said this is like minimal coupling. Very good. Now let's discuss, uh, yeah. That's maybe it's sort of a big question. You're gonna, the, the, the second term is clearly just, okay, I have a current, this and one? I'm gonna sort of couple yeah. The, the background gauge current. The first one is just a little different. It's got this BE squared term, like you mentioned. But this is a pure C counter term in the background fields. It doesn't involve any operators. Okay. So it's a counter term that you can or cannot add. If you don't add it, then what you that number shift. So it'll look like you have an anomaly. But this is an anomaly that can be removed or fixed by this counter term. And I see. So by shifting the counter terms, could we make it look more like the, could we give the magnetic field a counter term? We can shift all sorts of fields around, things around. But the, the, the thing that you just mentioned, this one, is somewhat natural because, because if you don't get rid of it, you get sort of a, a BE wedge star BE type anomaly, which depends on the metric and is not topological. You should think of this BE squared term as the analog of d squared in the compact boson, right? There's also an a squared, which serves exactly the same purpose. You it, it's not symmetric between the two. That, sort of that is more interesting, and that will have, that, that's where the anomaly between the electric and the magnetic symmetry will come from, just like in the compact boson. So we'll have more to say about that. Yeah. No, in the compact boson, the shim, the, the, it's a shift symmetry. You're thinking of a standard complex boson with charge that rotates by a phase. Then you have phi there too. That's fine. That's where the terminology Siegel term actually comes from because that diagram looks like a Siegel in QED. But in the compact boson, it's just this. So you see it's nearly identical. All right. What did I want to do next? So the next thing I wanted to say is let's look at how the Wilson loop transforms under this symmetry. Um, so I'm shifting A by this lambda E. Remember that the Wilson loop of charge QE is just the holonomy around the curve C. So if A shifts by lambda, then this shifts by a phase, which is EIQ times the holonomy of lambda. And this is the extremely easy way to see that the Wilson loop is charged under this symmetry because it picks up a phase involving the background gauge parameter without doing any computation. Now, this actually allows me to make contact with the comment that was the question that was asked yesterday. Uh, and the question was uh, about contractible cycles. You see, this holonomy of lambda is a, only going to be non-trivial if this cycle is contractible. Um, yeah, you'll, so, you'll, so, you'll, soon, you'll soon see that. Um, the, the reason is that the, the actual symmetry that leaves the background B field invariant involves flat lambda. But this is the background gauge symmetry. But if you want the, the actual symmetry that leaves B invariant, then you have to take lambda to be flat. And so this is the holonomy of a flat connection. And if the cycle is contractible, this is just zero. 
So that's the statement that the charged Wilson loops really have to live on non-contractable cycles, either because they wrap up non-contractable cycles in space-time, or because they link non-trivially with something else. OK. So now let's go into a little more detail on the second term, which is where some more interesting things will happen. So this is called the BF term. You can think of it as a kind of generalization of a Trent Simons term um, to four dimensions, a mixed Trent Simons term. And you see that this term is sort of straightforwardly invariant under the B magnetic gauge transformations. Because B magnetic shifts by D lambda magnetic, which is itself a U1 flux with, you know, which when you integrate it gives you 2 pi times an integer. Um, and if, because of the 1 over 2 pi that I put here, this term will shift by 2 pi i times an integer. So it's an OK shift in the action. So there's no problem with lambda magnetic gauge invariance in this term. We'll soon see about lambda. Before we get to that, let me say something about the Twift lines. The first thing we want to examine is what this term does when you encounter it in a Twift line. Yes. Because I was thinking that you would pass like the D to the D of the D A in the F, and this would give you zero. But you're saying that we are integrating? Well, it's a little more subtle than that because uh, la the lambdas are not well defined. So this, this sh thing shifts by i over 2 pi d lambda magnetic wedge F. And if lambda were well defined, you would just integrate by parts and use df equals 0. Yeah. But lambda has fluxes. OK? But that's OK. Because you see, so let's move the, some 2 pi's around. There's a 2 pi here. Let me multiply and divide by 2 pi in this term. So I get 2 pi i times this. So I have a 2 pi squared. I can move 1 2 pi here and 1 2 pi here. Now, when you have a conventionally normalized U1 gauge field, then f over 2 pi defines an, because, of, because it has integer fluxes, defines an integer cohomology class. So you can think of this as like the cup product of two integer cohomology classes. In other words, it will give you an integer. Because both of these are U1 connections. And then the 2 pi i here means that the action is invariant. So is another way to say it that, that B2 shifts by a two-form, which is closed, but in general not exact. And you're just writing it as d lambda, but if it's, if it's closed but not exact, then its periods are not trivial here. Correct. And it's only locally d lambda. That's right. Everything you would say about a standard connection, just with one extra form degree. Yeah. And so here, when we're uh, doing this gauge transformation, should we also change A to A plus lambda, or are we changing only B? B magnet, we're here we're doing the B magnetic gauge transformation. Oh, and well, it doesn't, well, I, so right now I'm checking B magnetic gauge invariance, and I found that the BF term is B magnetic gauge invariant, and I don't need to transform A1, you see. B magnetic just doesn't act on A1, so this term here is invariant, and this term here is also invariant. All right. But then, then you could say, well, what does? So if, if, uh, if A1 doesn't shift under B magnetic gauge transformations, then you know, what is charged under it? And of course, we know that the things that are charged under the magnetic symmetry are the Toft loops. And so there are two ways of seeing that. Um, one involves remembering that the Toft loop is the, what? Ah, yeah. oh, yes. This will happen a lot. Uh, thank you. So the, 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 the twist foot loop is the word line of a Dirac magnetic monopole of strength QM. And when you have a small sphere around the, when you take a small sphere around the loop and you integrate over it, you get that F over 2 pi is QM. Now when you do that in this term, when you absorb the F over 2 pi by integrating over the small sphere, you'll see that what you get is a, an integral of BM that's attached to a surface that ends on the loop. 
So you can pick a surface. This is the loop C. You can pick a sheet, kind of a half open sheet sigma, whose boundary is C. And then you'll get the integral of BM over that sheet. Why does this sheet appear? Because this is the sheet that's Poincaré dual to the sphere linking the line. Right? The sheet intersects the sphere exactly once. That's why it needs to be half open. Now, that's nice. So that means that, that the uh, Tuft line has this B sheet attached. And if you do a BM gauge transformation, right, then it means that this sheet shifts by BM plus D lambda M. And then if you integrate by parts on the d lambda, you see that you get the integral of lambda m on the Atuft line. So the Atuft line transforms exactly like the Wilson line did with Q e replaced by qm and lambda e replaced by lambda m. So the Atuft line is charged under the magnetic symmetry, even though a didn't shift under it. But remember that the Atuft line was also, or could also be the Wilson line in the magnetic dual presentation, where I change a uh, for a tilde. I trade a for a tilde. So if this can simultaneously be thought of as the dual Wilson line, charge qm, then the fact that this is charged under lambda m shifts means that a dual will shift under lambda magnetic. So if you wish, the analog of this formula is that a dual shifts under the magnetic symmetry. Very good. Any questions so far? OK. So we checked that this term in the action is invariant under everything. And we checked that this term in the action is invariant under B magnetic gauge transformations. What we have not yet checked is whether this BF term is invariant under electric gauge transformations. Because notice that here, I didn't put an F minus B, I just put an F. Here I put an F minus B in order to make this term invariant under the electric transformations. So let's now do that. So how does the BF term shift under the electric? Well, F shifts by d lambda e. And there's nothing to absorb that. So you see that the BF term shifts by i over 2 pi times the integral of B magnetic wedge d lambda electric. This is the only term in the action that is not exactly gauge invariant. It's only gauge invariant up to this term. This term is a C number. It only involves background fields. It doesn't involve fields, dynamical fields. And this is the indicator that the B electric and B magnetic symmetries have in the Tufta anomaly. All right. So this is very much like the mixed anomaly between momentum and winding in the compact boson. Sure. So indeed. So the hallmark of an anomaly is that you shouldn't be able to remove it with local counter terms. So the, the, the anomalies are the, the things that you cannot get rid of by adding local counter terms to the action. So indeed, we could contemplate local counter terms. And in particular, one local counter term you can contemplate is this one. There are others, but this is the one that will have the most obvious impact. So you could consider a counter term that looks like B electric wedge B magnetic. By the way, as Oliver also pointed out earlier, this anomaly is not symmetric in B electric and magnetic, right? It, this term was invariant under B magnetic, but not under B electric. So that's another thing that we might not like about it. 
All right, so we could try to get either get rid of the anomaly or at least make it symmetric between electric and magnetic by adding such a counter term. Right. So what does it mean to add such a counter term? It means that we're going to modify the way we couple the background fields to Maxwell theory. After all, I made some arbitrary choices when I did this. In particular, I didn't put any B electric here. And putting such a B electric add, amounts to adding such a counter term. Very good. And this coefficient doesn't need to be quantized because this counter term is never going to be gauge invariant under anything. This is neither gauge invariant under B electric nor under B magnetic. That's standard for these kind of counter terms and anomalies because you're trying to move the anomaly around from one symmetry to another symmetry, so you need something that is invariant under neither. Okay, so this k is just a real number. The i, however, is not negotiable. Um, I told you before that you could think of this as a generating functional for the currents. And what does this counter term do? When you look at the two point function of J electric and J magnetic, this counter term will modify this two point function by a contact term, a contact term involving delta functions at coincident points. That's what counter terms do. Now, by dialing this coefficient k, we can change these contact terms in such a way as to make either the electric current or the magnetic current or neither of them everywhere conserved. And by everywhere, I mean including at coincident points. And that's, that amounts to the statement that I can use this counter term to move this anomaly around, but I can never get rid of it completely. For example, if I choose k to be minus 1, then the DE electric, the D lambda electric piece of the anomaly exactly cancels against the variation of the electric B. But then the magnetic B will shift by its gauge transformations, and there'll be a, a C number shift coming from that. Or you could pick a random value for kappa, and then it looks like there's an anomaly coming from both. All right? So the thing that you can never do and you know, this is something, th th there'll be an easy argument in a second as to why, is find a counter term that get rid gets rid of the anomaly altogether. And also that means that, that the, the conserved currents will always have some contact terms in their conservation law that makes the one or both of them not conserved at coincident points. Very good. So by the way, this, also, this structure is also the hallmark of a mixed anomaly between these symmetries. You see, individually, by dialing the counter term, I can individually preserve the electric symmetry or the magnetic symmetry. The thing I cannot do is preserve both at the same time. Good. Now, an anomaly implies many good things. And on very general grounds, it implies that the theory cannot be completely trivial and gapped. That's totally obvious, since we're discussing a massless theory. In fact, you can show, this is a small exercise you can do if you want, you can show is very normally implies that certain contact terms in the conservation laws of J electric and J magnetic, and they essentially unambiguously fix those currents in terms of a single F. So you can actually, roughly speaking, deduce the existence of a free photon just from having the two currents and this mixed anomaly. Just like in Two dimensions, if you have a compact boson with the anomaly between winding and momentum, you can essentially reobtain re or re recover the compact boson itself. OK. Good. So another comment, which is always true of anomalies, is that this anomaly prevents us, in general, from gauging the full symmetry. If we, we cannot simultaneously gauge B electric and B magnetic. We haven't discussed that, what that means yet, but we'll do it soon. But we can find anomaly free subgroups. For example, any subgroup of just U1 electric or just U1 magnetic is anomaly free and can be gauged. So the last thing I want to do is I want to write the five dimensional action that gives rise to this anomaly by inflow. This is a standard thing to do. And it's also one of the easier ways to see which anomalies can or cannot be removed by counter terms. So this is something that we do in all walks of life, high energy physics, condensed matter physics. There are different names for this gadget. And maybe
maybe in high energy physics you would call it an anomaly inflow action. Maybe in condensed matter physics you'd call it an SPT. It's a 5D action for the background field to be electric and be magnetic. Be, you would also call it an invertible TQFT. And on a closed five manifold, this is completely gauge invariant under the respective background gauge transformations. It also has no dynamical degrees of freedom. If you quantize this on any spatial ma four manifold, you'll find exactly one state in the Hilbert space for every choice of four manifold. Notice also that on a five manifold, this is completely symmetric under interchanging E and B because you could integrate by parts. Now, if the five manifold happens to have a boundary, then some of these statements go out the window. The symmetry but due to integration by parts is lost because you would generate a boundary term when you do that. And also, one of those two B fields has, has to give rise to a non-trivial uh, gauge transformation on the boundary, right? So in this presentation, if you shift B electric, by d lambda electric, then you can, we'll get a boundary term that exactly reproduces this anomaly. Very good. And the statement that the anomaly cannot be removed by a local counter term directly in four dimensions is the statement that this 5D action is not its variant uh, local operator in 5D. In other words, it's a kind of Chern Simons type or BF type. Very good. By the way, I have chosen the, the sign of this term in such a way that the anomalous variation of this action exactly reproduces this formula, reproduces the anomaly of the boundary theory. This is a convention that's more standard in high energy physics, because we, th we usually think of this 5D theory as being a fictitious crutch to the imagination, whose only job in life it is to remind us of the anomaly of the boundary theory, but we don't actually believe that there is a fifth dimension. If you are in a situation where there is actually a fifth dimension, and for some good reason, you need the, this five-dimensional system to be completely anomaly-free. For example, you might want to gauge B electric and B magnetic. Then you pick the opposite sign here, and that means that the five-dimensional theory on the boundary will cancel the anomaly of the boundary theory, so that the coupled 5D, 4D system is anomaly free, and then you can gauge anything you want. So for example, this happens in supergravity and string theory, where these B fields might be the actual B fields of string theory. It also happens in condensed matter physics. Well, I mean, I'm just, saying, I'm just saying something which is tantamount to what I said before, which is that, that I mean, you could, you could try to strip this D off and, and pull this onto the boundary, but you will not succeed. You'll not be able to write something, you know, you'll not, you'll not be able to pull, pull this onto the boundary in a local way. Okay, other questions? Are you talking about here? The coefficient here is one. The coefficient here is one. The, the anomaly, this is not the anomaly. This is a counter term. Ignore that. This is the anomaly, and there's a coefficient one. Yeah. Other questions? OK. No, a Wesumino term is typically a term for dynamical fields whose job in life it is to match the anomaly. This is, this is not that. Because it's background and it's in 5D rather than 4D. This is a genuine 5D term that cannot possibly be written in 4D. The Wesumino term is often written in one higher dimension for convenience, but it doesn't need to be. And it, we certainly, you know, the Wesumino term in QCD lives in four dimensions. 
can secretly live in five dimensions. So it's, 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 it could be written most beautifully. In Absolutely. Just, so many things can be done more beautifully in the extra dimension, but, but, it, does, it, but it is intrinsically a 4D term for the 4D pion fields. Wes and Zumino didn't think about the fifth dimension. Wind. Yeah. <laughs> well, just to be clear, now you can get to the UR, uh, electric and you are magnetic. Yes, at the same time. correct. Because this, this coupled system is completely anomaly free. But now you have a theory that has dynamical fields in the bulk as well. So this is a genuine 5D, 4D coupled theory with now 5D bulk degrees of freedom. It's no longer a 4D field theory coupled to some background fields. Um, very good. OK, yeah. So here, if you try to write this in 4D, the price you pay is that the term field is on local. So well, uh, yeah, you'd have to solve some equation exactly, and it would be some. Uh, the, the price to pay for tr attempting to pull this onto the 4D boundary would be not locality, that's right. That was the question. OK, let me, uh, before we move on to the next topic, let me make a small detour. Uh, or a small comment that will be useful in a little, wi little bit. Um, so far, we've discussed pure Maxwell theory. And of course, in pure Maxwell theory, these B fields are not necessarily flat. They can have non-trivial fluxes. So dB, which is normally called H, is not necessarily 0. And in some units, it has integer fluxes or 2 pi integer fluxes. And that's related to the fact that we have actual conserved currents for those uh, symmetries. But we will soon go to situations where we only preserve discrete subgroups of these symmetries. Then uh, the B fields will be reduced to flat B fields. And there will be no more currents. And we'll be writing formulas for those flat B fields. And I wanted to make a small detour about how some of these formulas play out when you specialize to flat B fields. <laughs> Let me see exactly how I want to write this. OK, maybe I'll keep. This and I'll erase this. Now, when the B's are flat, all the gauge invariant information, as we learned in a lot of detail yesterday, is concerned uh, is contained in their holonomies. So, if you wish, you can define holonomies. I'm writing them as angles. These are the, if you wish, the Wilson surfaces of B electric and B magnetic on some two cycles, sigma 2. And if, if B is flat, then the dependence of this two cycle is topological. And because B itself shifts by D lambda, which has 2 pi integer fluxes, this is really an angle. So it has 2 pi identifications. So you can think of these integrals over B, or these holonomies of B, as angles. And one thing I wanted to say is that if you look at the coupling of the flat B fields to star F and to F, maybe it's a little bit more obvious with this one in the, in the way I've written it, then you'll see that when these B fields are flat, you can pull them uh, out of the integral and write the effect of inserting a flat B field with angle theta into the action as, for example, let me do it for the magnetic one. It'll look like e to the minus i over 2 pi. Then there'll be theta magnetic of some sigma. right? So I'm not imagining that E has holonomy theta magnetic on some sigma 2. And then you're left with the integral over the dynamical f over the Poincare dual uh, cycle. So this is the integral of f over the Poincare dual cycle to sigma. So what have I gotten here? What I've gotten here is e to the minus i theta m times the one form charge, the magnetic one form charge. And you see that the magnetic one form charge, which was in, defined on some two cycle, is evaluated on the cycle that's Poincare dual to the cycle where we put the flat connection. So for flat B fields, turning on a flat connection on some cycle is in one-to-one -one correspondence with inserting the exponentiated 
symmetry defect on the Poincaré dual cycle. This is a thing that you'll often hear in the context of these symmetries. That's the first comment. And you can do it for the electric symmetry as well. Um, the other thing we might want to do, and this will, will come up naturally in some of the models we're going to study next, is the following. So, so far, I've worked in terms of A1, which is a conventionally normalized U1 connection with two pi integer fluxes. And I've introduced this B field as a kind of enhancement or you know, dressing of the action. And A transforms under some gauge transformations. Now, one thing we can do when B is flat, which is quite nice, is remember we have this combination in the action that I just erased, electric, which was gauge invariant under conditions. And when B, B electric is flat, one thing you can do, and it's often done, either implicitly or explicitly, is to try to write this as D of something. Now, Greg will not like this, because nothing is well defined, but bear with me. Um, you can attempt to, at least locally, find a C, which looks like a U1 gauge field, but isn't whose field strength, dc, is not f, but f minus b. OK? In particular, if you integrate this equation over a two cycle, you'll see that the fluxes of c are no longer in 2 pi z. Because b is flat. I'm assuming I'm making comments about flat b. Very good. That's why this only works for the flat case. If you integrate this equation, you'll see that the fluxes of c are not in 2 pi, z, 2 pi z. They're shifted precisely by the holonomy of b on that two cycle. OK? And since we reviewed yesterday that the 2 pi z quantization of the fluxes is related to the standard periodicity of the gauge transformations for the gauge field, this means that having such a modified flux quantization means that the periodicity of C must adapt itself locally to accommodate this rule. So this is sometimes called a twisted gauge field. And for those of you who know, the most common example of that, which you might have encountered, is a spin C connection, which is a way of putting fermions of odd charge on manifolds that are not spin. I'm going to try my best to avoid void fermions in these lectures. So I'm going to find another example where this happens. Um, but that, in any case, is the simplest one. So you see, this is a very general thing I can do when B is flat. And we'll encounter various models where a, such a flat B will naturally occur. And then it'll often be convenient to use this twisted description of the gauge field. Any questions? C is the twisted gauge field, correct. C has modified fluxes. OK, so now we're going to start the next topic, which is we're finally going to get away from free field theory, but not quite from Maxwell theory itself. We're just going to take Maxwell theory, and we're going to enrich it with some charged matter. So the thing I'm going to do today is to discuss simple abelian gauge theories with matter and discuss their phases and the one symmetries and how these symmetries are realized and whether they have anomalies. And hopefully that will lead us up to tomorrow where I'll try to throw all this at some interesting non-abelian gauge theories. All right. So here's my favorite non-free theory. So we are going to add to free Maxwell theory a charge takes field of electric charge QE 
And if I'm sloppy, I'll sometimes abbreviate that as Q. So this is a scalar field. I'll call it little h of electric charge Q. So this is what in elementary QFT you would have called scalar QED, uh, except there you would have typically studied the case Q equals 1. OK. What's the Lagrangian? Well, I'm not going to write the background fields for now. They'll come soon. It's the Maxwell Lagrangian plus a kinetic term for H with a covariant derivative plus a potential, which needs to be U1 gauge invariant. I'm in Euclidean signature, so I'm putting the plus sign. And since the field has charge Q, I'm putting a Q in the covariant derivative. OK. Yes? Um, why are you using um, Q views instead of uh, differential forms of Q? No. Okay. <laughs> Just to, you know, it's, it, it's shorter to write it. This formula is shorter. And, uh, otherwise, I'm going to have to. <laughs> I'm one of the old people now. OK. Yeah, this is certainly how some of us were brought up. Um, <laughs> and look, every presentation makes some things easy and some things hard. So you should try to get accustomed to all of them. All right. Yeah, if we want to introduce the background fields, I'll just make a certain words. We can do it just as we did before, right? Take a in the combination F minus B electric and B magnetic appears in the BF term. We'll get back to the background fields in a second. OK, so the first important observation is that this is an electric, electrically charged scalar. There's no magnetic charge anywhere inside. This gauge field A, whose field strength is F, is a standard U1 connection, and therefore the Bianchi identity still holds. It's not modified. Therefore, the magnetic one-form symmetry survives untouched. There's a full U1 magnetic in this system. However, the electric one-form symmetry will be modified. And there's an obvious way to see this. The electric one-form symmetry in the Maxwell case was associated with a current whose conservation was the non-trivial or non-Bianchi Maxwell equation, d star f equals 0. And if you have electrically charged matter, that equation is modified famously uh, the electric current on the right-hand side. Since there's an electrically charged field, there is an electric current on the right-hand side of Maxwell's equation. So the continuous part of the electric symmetry, if you wish, is obviously broken because the current is not conserved. This cannot be salvaged. Uh, and the, the most that could happen, the best that could happen, is that this breaks to some discrete subgroup. It might be broken completely, or it might break to some discrete subgroup. Right? Um, and we would like to figure out what the discrete subgroup is. Now, there's a few disc, um, kind of intuitive ways of guessing what it might be. One is that if you look at this equation, it does have the electric current on the right-hand side. But because the scalar has charge Q, electric charge is, roughly speaking, quantized in units of Q. And that means you might be able to exponentiate this equation and get conservation modulo Q. So the, a good guess, which will turn out to be correct, is that this breaks to its ZQ electric subgroup. Q 
here is another way of saying that, which is more precise. Um, yesterday, I mentioned that the electric one-form symmetry, flux con electric flux conservation, was associated with the statement that if you take any Wilson line of any charge, it cannot end, right? Because you can measure the electric flux using the topological charge operators, and you can move those around. And that flux can never terminate. However, now we have a charged QE scalar field. So we can just stick this scalar field at the end of the line. And then this is gauge invariant, if we choose the charge of the line to be exactly the same as the charge of the scalar field. This is the standard way, or a standard way, in which we make charged fields gauge invariant by sticking a Wilson line on them. So this is a gauge invariant operator, and it allows the charge QE Wilson line to end. Right. However, Wilson lines of charge less than QE cannot end, because there's no charged field in this theory of charge less than QE. Right? And so this also supports this statement. We have electric flux conservation modulo QE. This breaking and the fact that this line can end is also associated with the phenomenon known as screening. Right? The charged field here can screen the Wilson line by attaching itself everywhere along the line and kind of pair creating little bits of charge that screen the entire line. Now, perhaps the most precise way to convince yourself that this breaking pattern is indeed the correct one is to re-examine what happens to the background fields. Right? When we coupled Maxwell theory to BE and BM, we were able to show that it, up to a, a Tooth anomaly, which we understood, there was background gauge invariance under those symmetry, and that, that means that the symmetry is, is really there. So if this ZQ electric symmetry is preserved, we should somehow be able to couple <laughs> this theory to a ZQ subgroup of the original U1 electric. And that means we should have some kind of ZQ version of the electric B field, discrete version of the one-form gauge field. Right. So remember that in the original Maxwell theory, the one-form gauge transformations looked like this. B electric shifts by D lambda electric, which is locally a one-form, and A1 shifts by lambda electric. Now this shift by lambda electric right, is a real problem for this covariant derivative here. This is the term that has the problem. This is the only term that has the problem. This is the coupling of the Maxwell field to the, the matter field. And so we have to figure out how to make d invariant under whatever symmetry we're going to preserve. Um, and the first thing that I already said previously is that we need to make B flat. And if this guess is, is correct, we should be able to make it into a flat ZQ electric gauge field. So something whose holonomies are valued in ZQ. So I already described the holonomies of B in terms of angles. And in the U1 case, these angles could take any value between 0 and 2 pi. In order to restrict to ZQ holonomies, we need to restrict this angle to be 2 pi over QE times an integer. So if you take the additive uh, convention for ZQE, so that it consists of the numbers 0, 1, 2, et cetera, up to QE minus 1, then these are the allowed angles. And 
if these are the allowed angles, these are the allowed holonomies of B, then you can make a connection between the flat B fields and um, ZQ cohomology classes. Right? So you can think of up to gauge transformations for B. You can think of this B as being 2 pi over Q electric times what I'll call, I guess I'll call it little b electric here. Little b electric is still a background field. It's not dynamical. And let me get rid of this because this is the U1 rule. And the fact that B has these holonomies means that we can identify B electric as an element of H2 with coefficients in ZQ. So flat B fields with ZQ holonomies are in one-to-one -one correspondence with discrete cohomology classes and the second cohomology with coefficients in QE. So now we're in shape. Because what will happen when I, when I do a one-form gate transformation of A here? Well, A sh will shift by lambda. But QA will shift by Q lambda. Now, lambda is the gauge transformation parameter for B. So you can uplift it or relate it to a change in the cohomology class of little b. So a one-form gauge symmetry transformation of big B is in one-to-one -one correspondence with modifying little b by something exact. Let me call it little lambda, which is a one cochain with coefficients in ZQ. And when you plug this little lambda into this formula, you can convince yourself that because of the multiplication by Q, this thing vanishes modulo other gauge transformations that you can do. The other gauge transformation that I keep talking about are the ones that relate or, the, or that, that, that bring about the embedding of this discrete ZQ cohomology into the continuous B fields that we've been using. But essentially, we can switch. Q, sorry. The thing that vanishes is Q times lambda E. Lambda E is a. Uh, uh, so you're checking invariance of the. I'm checking invariance of the covariant derivative under ZQ, under shifts by a ZQ flat connection. Very good. OK, so with this small extra element of formalism that we need to think of the background fields as living in ZQ cohomology, we see that the covariant derivative is invariant under those background gauge transformations. The, very good. So we have U1 magnetic, all of it, and we have a ZQ electric subgroup of the electric one-form symmetry, which is non-trivial unless Q is 1. So one thing I want to do for you is to write down the 5D anomaly inflow action for, for symmetries in terms of these B fields, these new B fields that we've just introduced, the discrete ones. So this theory will inherit the Etoft the anomaly of Maxwell's theory, even though the symmetry is reduced. So remember that in Maxwell's theory, the anomaly 
was captured by a 5D action that could be written like this. Where both B electric and B magnetic were U1 to form gauge fields. Now B electric is reduced to ZQ. So B electric is 2 pi over Q times this little b. Now little b is an element of ZQ valued cohomology. So you have to, you can't wedge it with anything. You better multiply it with something that also lives in that cohomology. But you can do that. Remember that the fluxes of B magnetic, if I divide them by 2 pi, this in square, uh, in square brackets defines an integral cohomology class in H3, because the fluxes of this thing are integers. Okay, And such an integral cohomology class can be reduced modulo QE. So you can write this whole thing as 2 pi i over QE, B electric, which is the cohomology element cup db magnetic over 2 pi reduced to zq coefficients. This is one expression in cohomology with zq coefficients. And you see that when b electric shifts by a change of the cohomology representative like this, by delta of lambda 1, where lambda 1 is a 1 co-chain with coefficients in ZQ, this still shifts. And so it still represents an anomaly. So this anomaly, whatever it is and whatever it does, is a descendant of the anomaly in Maxwell theory. And whatever we do with this model, we will have to match this anomaly. We will start deforming this model in a second by adding by modifying the potential and going to different phases. And we'll look what these phases look like. And whatever phase we end up in, we better have a theory that can match this anomaly. In particular, it will not be possible to trivially gap this model if Q electric is bigger than 1. So that's what I'm going to do next. Any questions about this before we move on? Got 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. Thanks. This is uh, the cup product in cohomology. So this is a this is a multiplication of cohomology classes. Very schematically, you can think of it as an analog of wedge for cohomology. Other questions? Yeah. So here, the screening can happen as long as the charge of H is some divisor of the charge of Wilson line. Correct. Um, that's right. So any, any Wilson line whose charge is a multiple of QE can be screened. Every Wilson line that is not a multiple of QE can be screened down so that its charge lies between 0 and Q electric. So that's why the screening is modulo Q electric. Other questions? Well, uh, so the question was whether it has to be an integer between 0 and Q electric. All the Wilson lines had integer charges to begin with. This was, this was something that came from U1 charge quantization. Yeah. All right. So now we are going to start exploring different phases of this model. If you wish, what we did right now is a UV analysis of the model. We wrote the Lagrangian. And we analyzed its symmetries and its background fields, which is something we did without committing to a vacuum, without analyzing its dynamics. It's all kinematics. So now we're going to try to see what this model does in different phases and, and how the constraints of symmetries and anomalies play out.
And this model is simple, but it's not that simple. It's very, very rich, and lots of things can be seen from it. So let's add a potential. It could be a very complicated potential in principle, but it'll be simple enough to just take the standard phi to the fourth type potential. I don't have a phi here. I'm calling it h. And I'm going to allow myself to dial m. I'm going to keep this fixed and positive. What do we know about this model? Actually, in 4D, we know a fair bit about this model. We know that, that it has two phases, one for, roughly speaking, positive m and one for negative m. It has a single phase transition at some critical m. I'm going to pick conven conventions in which this critical m is 0, which I can do. And it's known that the transition at that point is a first order phase transition. That's the famous Coleman Weinberg mechanism. That radiative corrections near the would be second order transition come in and make the transition first order. We're not going to be so much talking about the transition itself, but rather about the physics in one phase or the other. And as you'll see, they will realize the symmetries and the anomalies very differently. All right, so phase one is the positive mass phase. If you wish, you can think of m as being very large. It's the only scale in the problem, so it doesn't really matter. What happens when m is very large? Well, we can integrate it h out. Right? h has 0 vev. It has mass m. Therefore, we can integrate it out. And at low energy, we recover a theory that only has a photon. So this leads to an IR effective action, which is simply Maxwell theory deformed by irrelevant operators. This is sometimes called the Euler-Heisenberg Lagrangian. So this is the Maxwell kinetic term, which is marginal. And then you have an infinite series of higher order corrections, the first of which looks like f to the fourth divided by m to the fourth. There are two such terms, actually. And there are many, many higher order terms. But the higher order terms are irrelevant, so they do not affect the long distance behavior of the theory. At long distances, this flows to pure Maxwell theory. So this is the theory we beat to death. And in particular, this theory is in the Coulomb phase. Right? All Wilson loops and Atuft loops have perimeter law. And the magnetic one form tree is spontaneously broken. The whole U1. Well, Maybe I'll write this a little bit more dramatically over here. Let's look at the various symmetries in their, in their realization. So we know that our model has a ZQ electric one-form symmetry and a U1 magnetic one-form symmetry. So in the Coulomb phase, this one is spontaneously broken to nothing. And this one is also spontaneously broken to nothing. All loops have perimeter scaling. And the photon can again be thought of as the Goldstone boson for this broken U1. However, remember yesterday we talked a lot about the fact that the free Maxwell theory doesn't just have the discrete ZQ electric one form symmetry, it has the full continuous u1. So what happens is that as you go to very long distances, this zq actually enhances to an accidental or an emergent u1 electric. And you can see this explicitly in the Euler-Heisenberg Lagrangian. If you compute Maxwell's equations from this Lagrangian, you see there's no charge matter anywhere. The charge matter lives at the scale m, has been integrated out. This Lagrangian only depends on f. And Maxwell equation will look something like d star f from the first term. And then there will be lots of other terms like f cubed, et cetera, 
lots of stuff involving higher powers of f's, but there'll be some two form here built out of the f's, and Maxwell's equation will say d star of that form is zero to any order in the derivative expansion. So the U1 electric symmetry of Maxwell theory has reemerged, has reappeared, because we've integrated out the charged field that broke it. And so the correct, the more precise thing to say is that the ZQ electric enhances in the infrared to U1, and then that U1 is spontaneously broken, just like in free Maxwell theory. Hopefully, it is time for me to make one important point before the break. Emergent symmetries are very common, both for zero form and for higher form symmetries. This is an example of an emergent higher form symmetry. However, there's one thing that's very different about emergent higher form symmetries, and that's how good the emergent symmetry is. Right? Emergent symmetries, by definition, are not exact. They're broken at some scale, and they're good at low energies. And then the question is, how badly are they broken? And for zero form symmetries, they are typically broken by irrelevant operators in the low energy effective action. So for, for example, if you take the dimension six operators in the standard model that are responsible for proton decay, they break B minus L symmetry. And these are irrelevant operators, but they're operators constructed out of the low energy fields of the standard model. So you can still describe the violation of the symmetry in terms of those degrees of freedom. Here, the low energy degree of freedom is F. And this is the most general effective action for F without anything else. And you see that there's absolutely no, no Lagrangian that I can write in terms of F that will encode a violation of the one form symmetry. And there's a very good reason for that. Right? In the case of zero form symmetry, the the way that you encode the breaking is you say, oh, well, there's a charged operator. In the case of baryon number, it's a dimension six operator, the local operator built out of the standard model fields. And it's charged, and you add it to the action. So this is delta L. And once you add this operator to the action, this action is no longer symmetric. However, I explained yesterday that for topological reasons, there is no local operator that is charged under a one-form symmetry, because one-form symmetry cannot link local operators. So that's why there's nothing I can add to this action that's local in the low energy fields that breaks the one form symmetry. This is at first very puzzling. It seems almost like a paradox. Clearly the symmetry is broken, we know that. So what does it mean that, that you cannot encode the breaking in the low energy effective action? Well, in order to answer that, you have to remind yourself what a low energy effective action is. A low energy effective action is a derivative expansion in small energy, right? So a lo low energy effective action, the Lagrangian, is a power series expansion in a small parameter, which is roughly energy divided by mass. This is an infrared scale, a small energy at which we're doing experiments. For example, we're scattering photons at small energies in this Euler-Heisenberg Lagrangian. So this is a power series expansion. And anything that is polynomial in small epsilon has to be captured by the low energy effective theory. This is how Weinberg invented low energy effective theory. He said, it's some machine that reproduces the correct power series expansion in this. OK? Now, the fact that we cannot possibly write any local operators that break the symmetry means that the violation of the symmetry is not polynomial in epsilon. It's exponentially small. So U1, magnet, U1 electric is broken to ZQE by effects that look like E to the minus 1 over epsilon, which have zero power series expansion. And when you put it back in this scale, you see that the mass of the particle appears like e to the minus m times some infrared length. So this is some amplitude for a very massive particle to propagate a long distance r. And you need that effect in order to explicitly trigger the screening. And so you see that this kind of effect is exponentially suppressed at long distances. At distances much longer than the mass of the particle. By contrast, 
the violations of baryon symmetry in the standard model are order epsilon or order epsilon squared because it's dimension six. So that's the difference. Any questions? Well, charge defects in Maxwell theory, those are the Wilson lines, and you can put them in. Uh, but they do not capture this phenomenon of screening. They will describe the exact propagation of the particle. But I don't think it's really understood how to capture this phenomenon of screening at the level of an effective Lagrangian. But roughly speaking, what I was trying to explain here is that it shouldn't be. But maybe there's a more sophisticated thing that can do it. Other questions? One question. Yeah. So where is this non non-analyticity Well, well, roughly speaking, I was, that was the analogy I was trying to make here. So the uh, the uh, you, you can think of this e to the minus m times r type factor as a kind of instant on effect that involves kind of pair creating the heavy particle out of the vacuum to screen the line, right? To screen the line, you really need to pair create charge along the entire line. And, and you need to do that all the way out to long distances, because the line is infinitely long and goes to infinity. So this costs you. So can, can you keep pursuing these ideas and include some sort of instanton sectors in the low energy effective action to calculate it? Uh, yeah, you could try. You know, so so for yeah, indeed. So you could, in various situations, you might be tempted to to um, think of the propagation of the particle as some instant on that you can take into account. For example, this it doesn't work for everything, but but it works for certain things. For example, you could imagine looking at the ground state degeneracy on a torus, which is protected if there is a one form symmetry. It's something that's common in and. And in that, if the, if the one-form symmetry is exact, then the ground state degeneracy is exact. But if it's only approximate and it's broken by such effects, then there's exponentially small instant on effects that break the ground state degeneracy by a very small amount. So you know, when, when people say that in interesting topological field theories, you have exact ground state degeneracies, that's only true in the approximation that you don't include the charged fields, the heavy charged fields. If you include the heavy charge fields, those ground state degeneracies are typically lifted by such exponentially small corrections. Yeah, and then people estimate the size of these effects using some kind of world line instanton type action. But in some way or another, you're going to have to put the charged particle back in, at least a little bit. So is, is it time to stop? OK, so we'll stop here, and then we'll keep going very soon. Like e to the minus one over epsilon and not e to the minus one over epsilon squared. So it, you know, is that why is the scaling is like linear? Well, because the scaling is like them that. Yeah, but then it's not like it cannot be thought as an instant. Right? No, it can. And you, you think of it as a world line. And if you take the if you take the world line action for a heavy particle, then an instant on produces exactly that. So, okay. This, so. But what my the common law is that if the, this epsilon is the coupling constant. So epsilon is a fictitious the, thing. Yeah, fictitious. The epsilon still, is this. Yeah, even if it is the, like a fictitious coupling constant, the, the, any instant on that I expect in that expansion will be like it is, it's like have, have, has to be quadratic, right? So, you know, my, my point here is that the, this, okay. this effects can exist, but is it true that I, really we can think about an instant on? I think I roughly speaking know what you're talking about, but this situation is much simpler than what you have in mind. This is the action for a heavy particle. Yes. Okay. And you're just wrapping around. Yeah, if you have a particle that's propagating a distance l, the action is e to the minus m times l. So whatever you want to call the coupling, it's that. I see. Okay. You can call it epsilon squared if you want. All right. Okay. All right, let me see. Okay. 
ask you a question. Yeah. Could you maybe briefly repeat what we did here for one square greater than zero? I was a little hmm? lost. Could you repeat what did you do here with like? Why well, when m is bigger than zero, then h is just a heavy particle, and I can just integrate it out. Do you want me to get your cup of coffee? I'm gonna go. Let, let, let's go and have some coffee, and we can talk on the way. We'll come back in. I feel like it's always the speakers who get the, the, the fewest refreshments. <laughs> no, okay. uh, a little bit of caffeine will be good though. No, there's also to eat. Go for it over the front. I think that's fine. Yeah, maybe I'll quickly just uh, quickly jump in. Oh, you right? Yeah, I know, but I was... You were right, but you... I think I'm missing. Yeah, so there was a whole bunch of questions here. Yeah, I was asking. So what was the story that you said we can integrate out M and then we can get a higher order of S? Well, you, when you integrate out a heavy field like H, right, it introduces interactions between the photons. So for example, you can have photon-photon scattering that's mediated by a one-loop diagram involving H. Right. And at long distances, that's captured by an F to the fourth term in the effective action. And then why did you say that this breaks uh, U1 electric and U1 magnetic both of them? Well, so there's, there's a whole bunch of breaking going on. Some of them are explicit, some of them are spontaneous. So the first statement was that the charge Q field breaks the U1 electric symmetry explicitly. So it's, in other words, U1 electric is not a symmetry of, the, of this model. Only the ZQ subgroup is. However, at long distance, the ZQ to the one because of what I was explaining. Why do you say that U1 magnetic also breaks? Yeah, U1 magnetic also breaks because U1 U1 magnetic is a good symmetry. And, oh, excellent. No, I'll turn it off because I'm yelling. <laughs> 